Nung was determined to learn English. So when an Adventist English language center opened in her town in northern Laos, she jumped on the opportunity. She took this very seriously and came up with a goal to learn 100 new vocabulary words per day. Nung didn't have a background in English, but through hard work, she quickly began to understand the language. She faithfully attended classes and practiced with native English speakers until she became fluent. Speaking English made it possible for her to go to an Adventist university in Thailand. She's currently enrolled in Asia Pacific International University's education and psychology programs, and she hopes to use her new skills back home in Laos. The local Adventist English Language Center didn't only offer her the chance to learn English, it also provided a chance to learn about Jesus. Nung and her mother were among the first to join the center's weekly Sabbath worship services. At first, only seven people gathered in a small home. Today, that number has grown to more than a hundred people every week. Like many others, Nung and her mother gave their hearts to Jesus. In 2018, a portion of the 13 Sabbath offering helped expand this English language center. It has been a blessing to dozens of students like Nun who have been able to explore new opportunities. Now you have the chance to contribute to another special school in Laos through this quarter's 13 Sabbath offering. Part of Laos has been very difficult for Adventists to reach. In 1957, Pastor Dick Hall and his wife and children came to the city of Luang Namtha to introduce Jesus to the Lao people. He worked for four years before they were forced to evacuate due to war. They left behind a handful of new believers who were still young in their faith. Today, there is only one Adventist left in this city. Luang Namtha has become a strategic location as Laos' northern gateway to China. An Adventist presence can help the community grow as the city expands. The Lao Adventist Mission plans to build a bilingual primary school here. With your contribution to the 13th Sabbath offering, they hope a new school can become an integral part of this community. Please support the work in this part of the world by contributing this quarter. Thank you for giving to the 13th Sabbath offering. Hello friends, and welcome to our annual virtual Sabbath experience. My name is Thor. I'm the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Amita Health. And I'm very excited today to join with you as we continue this wonderful Adventist tradition. It's a tradition that reminds us of our Adventist heritage and the importance of our mission to extend the healing ministry of Jesus. It's a tradition that also honors the spirit of the Sabbath, a day of rest, reflection, and worship a day of enjoyment and connection with God. Today, I invite all of us to reflect and worship together as we hear inspiring stories about how our associates, despite the many challenges of the pandemic, have persevered to deliver exceptional whole care, honoring God by caring for the whole person, body, mind, and spirit. We will also hear from our leaders about our commitment to reaching beyond the walls of our hospitals and partnering with faith-based organizations to provide whole care in the community. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, Jesus says, Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Our associates take these words to heart every day. And today, while recognizing their selfless efforts, we also will give prayerful thanks for the opportunity to bring positive change to the communities we serve by following the one who leads us through these uncertain times. Now revealed 
a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus Christ my King What a beautiful name it is Nothing compares to this What a beautiful name it is This is Cecile Truver. She is the director of radiology at Bolingbrook Medical Center and has been at Bolingbrook for over 30 years. She never imagined that a crisis like the pandemic would arrive at her door. So I think the hardest part of the pandemic was when the governor enacted the stay-at-home order. I did not know how it was gonna impact my associates or our families at the time. It was very difficult. There was a lot of uncertainty, a lot of uncertainty I hadn't felt um, since 9-11. You came into work every day, not sure if you were gonna come home and bring this disease home to your families. Watching my team go into a room to take care of a patient, the questions were always reeling in my head. Did they do everything that they could to protect themselves? Your job is to protect your team. And it's not like you could work from home. You had to be there with them. They were in the thick of things. You had to show them you were there to support them at every turn. The biggest thing for me was my faith. My faith kept me going to work every day. I started every morning um, in prayer just praying for protection for my team, for the hospital, and just making sure that you know we were gonna come home every day safe and not bring this disease home to our family. Um, that was the biggest thing. It was faith over fear every day. Just you know, continual prayer and just making sure that we were doing our best to keep each other safe. I think the biggest um, thing I can remember, or most inspiring thing I remember, was seeing a patient go home after weeks in the ICU. All the associates gathered in the lobby to watch this patient go home, and what was really amazing was watching us all pray over this family um, as they receive their family member back home. It was, it was God's miracle to see this. This is Michael Kindom a chaplain at Hinsdale Hospital. He has worked at Hinsdale for two years. Just months before the pandemic, he moved from Glendale, California with his wife and newborn daughter. When COVID hit, the fear was absolutely real. I was terrified to go into uh, COVID patients' rooms there was a lot of concern around the time about taking COVID home to our families, and this was a real source of fear for me and my family. Working as a healthcare chaplain during these last 18 months has taken a toll on me emotionally, physically, as well as mentally. I found that I needed help, so I looked to my system for the employee assistance program and went through counseling sessions. And that I found really, really helped me. I recall at one time that I was paged to an emergency department in the Glen Oaks campus. And the patient was an elderly person who had COVID and their family member was not allowed to go into the room so we had offered to connect him virtually to his mother and as i offered the final blessing for this lady she was deemed to be not oriented and not alert so this was mainly for the family but when we put the device right before her eyes so that she can see her son her son in tears was saying his final goodbye 
after the visit, her vitals started to go down very rapidly. Ten minutes after I had left the hospital, the manager of the emergency department gave me a call and he said that she had passed away. She realized that this was her son saying goodbye and she was able to pass away peacefully. This is Sheila Short. Sheila has worked as a physical therapist at Hinsdale Hospital for the last eight and a half years. When the pandemic hit, Sheila was five months pregnant. Her friends and family all tried to convince her to stay home until after she gave birth, but she was driven to continue working by a strong desire to care for her patients. Seeing patients struggling through different things, everybody kind of handling it differently. I knew for me, going to work was the right answer. I can also say that returning to work right after the maternity leave uh, did not lessen the stress um, because now it was a whole different type of worry where now I was worrying about nursing or, you know, cuddling or snuggling with my son, what I was bringing home to him. Those were probably the biggest concerns for me. I think even to this day, um, every single time I go into a patient's room, I think to myself, is my mask fully sealed? Is any skin exposed? Am I fully, you know, um, protected with the PPE? And then I think to myself, can somebody else pick up my son from daycare so that I can get straight home to a shower or to throw my clothes in the washing machine? My source of strength was definitely my faith. My faith in God, my faith in medicine, my faith in my profession, and absolutely my faith in my coworkers and the first responders. I thank God every day for my coworkers and especially one in particular. I have one coworker who is one of the many true heroes that has really directly impacted me. She um, has taken COVID patients head on from the very beginning. We had, uh, I believe, four coworkers that were pregnant at the time. So all of us uh, could not go in the rooms initially. And she um, continued to go in those rooms day after day she actually lost three of her close family members within a six week uh, period of time to COVID. And even to this day, she still takes the initiative to go in those rooms regularly to try to limit, you know, as much as she can, uh, the other coworkers' unnecessary exposure. This is Lois Berg, a nurse manager at Bolingbroke Medical Center. She manages the recovery room, same-day surgery, and endoscopy department. She has been at Bolingbroke since January of 2008. At the onset of the pandemic, elective surgeries were halted, and Lois activated her staff to help the departments in greatest need. There was a lot of anxiety. There still is anxiety caring for COVID patients because Nobody wants to get sick, no one wants to feel lousy, and nobody wants to bring a disease home to their family and loved ones. But it's, it's been a tricky time. We had to navigate nurses being uncomfortable, and we had to navigate having the right staff, the right number of staff, to maintain uh, safe levels of staffing in my areas, and then uh, also rotate through our helping out the other departments. So our, our staffing challenges were real tricky at the peak of COVID. It was, uh, it was a difficult time for everyone. And nurses wanted to be safe. Nurses wanted to keep their families safe. And of course, we wanted to keep our patients safe. I have such a remarkable staff. We all felt a loyalty and a sense of duty to our patients and to the hospital. We love our hospital, we love our department, we love our co-workers. And I think I kept coming back just because I was in it with my, with my staff. We were all a team. Our, our spiritual emphasis was on uh, the land between. 
And we really felt like even now we're, we're in the land between with COVID, but with such a wonderful group of faithful workers, uh, I'm blessed. I'm blessed that I have the employees that I have. Uh, we pitch in, we help each other. My group of nurses do a wonderful job of helping relieve patients' anxiety, whether it's through prayer or holding a hand or a quick hug or doing something humorous just to help lighten the mood in the room. Uh, our nurses here have a good sense of, of what's going to help the patient before they go in for a procedure. Hello everyone, I'm Keith Parrott, President and CEO of Amita Health. Thank you for joining us today. Since I assumed this role in January 2020, right before the pandemic began, I've been impressed and humbled by the selfless efforts of our associates, like the ones whose stories you just heard. With their knowledge, compassion, and commitment, these courageous healthcare professionals have led us through the challenges and uncertainties of the pandemic showing us what it means to extend the healing ministry of Jesus by providing high quality, holistic care. Seventh-day Adventists call upon one another to live as positive examples of God's love and care. And our associates, regardless of their faith background, have modeled this behavior in a truly inspirational way. We also have found strength and inspiration in the support we have received from our partners in the local faith community, including Adventist churches and other faith-based organizations. They have provided a spiritual anchor in these uncertain times, reminding us through their unwavering support what's really important and why we have been called to do this work. Their support has ranged from hosting a mobile food pantry to offering care to those in need at our recent Mission at Home Clinic in Hinsdale to blessing and praying with our ministry leaders. Suffice to say, our Adventist partners have been there for us at every turn, and we are very grateful for their support. Every day, our associates demonstrate a profound commitment to our mission. During these challenging times, we have looked for mercy and grace, goodness and hope, and it has helped us become a stronger, more united, and more resilient organization. We will continue to fulfill our mission and promote the mindset of whole person care, focusing on treating the whole person to help patients commit to living their best life. Again, I want to thank you for joining us today. May God bless you and be with you. Hi, my name is Adam Maycock, President and CEO of Amita Health Adventist Medical Centers, Hinsdale and LaGrange. It's such a privilege to be here today sharing about the partnership between our hospitals and our churches. Both of our organizations have had rich histories in their communities the churches serving the spiritual needs of our community and the hospitals the physical needs. What a perfect opportunity to blend those two in extending the healing ministry of Jesus outside the walls and inside the walls of our hospitals. Recently, we had the opportunity to spend a little time together in the hospital, pastors, administration, in the same room, thinking about a future where we are able to meet the needs of our communities in collaboration. I'm excited today that we have this chance to share this with our community on this hospital Sabbath, and we look forward to the opportunity to continue this partnership for years to come. My name is Bruce Christian. I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer of Advent Health Bolingbrook Medical Center. I'm excited today to just share with you the good things that are going on between the hospital and the Adventist churches in our area, specifically the Bolingbrook Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm excited really today because of the relationship that we've developed between Pastor Dave and the hospital and the benefit that we've seen from that relationship. And we just look forward to continuing to build on this relationship with each of the pastors and the churches in our region. This past week, we had the opportunity to meet with the local pastors here in our, our area around the hospital. And they basically prayed over myself and our team and what an inspiration that was to me and to our staff. Because we're so enthused about the opportunity to work with the pastors in this area and to make a difference, a small difference in the lives of other people, as well as being able to extend the ministry of the healing of Jesus as we continue to pray and work for the day when 
we will have no more sorrow, no more suffering, and no more illness. Please join me for a word of prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we come to you today and ask for your blessing on the people who are gathered this Sabbath to worship you. We pray in a very special way and thank you for the ministry of hope, health, and healing that you have given to us. We pray and ask for your blessing on our hospitals here in the Chicagoland area, that they will be places of compassion, that they will be places of hope for the people who enter their walls. We ask that you will bless us, help us, our families, our hospitals, and our churches to be places of healing, hope, and restoration for the people around us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for Hospital Sabbath. I'm thankful for our hospital ministry. I'm thankful for our Amita associates, especially those who work in one of our Adventist hospital campuses. So I wanna say thank you. Thank you for extending the healing ministry of Christ to our community, and thank you for representing him well. Uh, today I wanna to talk to you about living and leading through uncertainty. Now, one of the most important questions for people of faith is, how do I hang on to God when things are not okay? How do I live through uncertainty or difficulty? What do I do when I'm filled with disappointment, confusion, anger, or fear? How do we keep going when things are tough? Today, I want to draw your attention to one of the oldest and strangest yet most powerful stories, not just in the Bible, but in all of human history. It's recorded in the biblical book of Job. And the story starts in verse one. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and he was upright. He feared or respected God and he shunned evil. Verse 2 says he had seven sons and he had three daughters and he owned 7,000 sheep and, and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 donkeys and he had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among the people of the East. So translation for today, Job is a man of reputation. Job is highly respected. He is successful. He is powerful. He is wealthy and he had it all. He had family, he had wealth, he had position, he had health, and he was a religious man. He was a man of faith. Verse 4, his sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite the three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. It says early in the morning, he would sacrifice burnt offerings for each of them thinking, perhaps my children have sinned. Perhaps they have cursed God in their hearts. And it says that this was Job's custom. So in the beginning of the story, everything is as we think it should be. Everything is going well. Job is a good man. He's a pious man. He's a cautious man. So cautious that he even offers sacrifices for his children just in case just in case they did anything wrong, just in case they sinned. Now, Job has this wonderful life, and he is thankful, but trouble is coming to us. Us is the place where very bad things happen to a very good man. Us is the place where suffering and difficulty come often without warning and without explanation, and God is not there. At least that's how it seems. Now, everyone who is listening right now will spend some time in the land of us. Maybe, maybe you're there right now. There are so many people for whom life is uncertain, where things are not okay. Anxiety, depression, disappointment, problems at home with, with children or a spouse, loss of job, or the fear of the loss of job, financial stress, health concerns, many things. Now, in verse 6 of this story, there's a radical shift in the scenery. See, the writer has set up the book of Job like it's this play. The story, the action is going 
on in two different locations on two what we would call stages. There's a lower stage and there's an upper stage. On the lower stage, we see and we hear what's happening down here on earth. And on the upper stage, we see and hear what is happening in heaven. Now we, we, the readers, know what's going on in both settings, on both stages, but the characters on earth, those on the lower stage, do not. All they can see or hear is what's happening on earth. So Job, he cannot see, Job cannot hear, Job does not know what is happening on the upper stage. Verse 6. We go to the upper stage. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan, the evil one, the adversary, also came with them. And then there's this conversation that occurs between God and Satan. And Satan makes an argument that Job only follows God because of God's blessing. He's got everything. Why wouldn't he? And as a result of this conversation, Job loses his livestock. Job loses his wealth, his servants, even his children, and his health. And we wait to see how he responds. And we're told that Job grieves, but that he also worships. He speaks words of blessing and praise. The Bible says that in all this, Job did not sin. He does not curse God. He does not blame God. He does not leave God. Things are uncertain, but Job remains faithful. That's point number one. Now, from here on out, the action will be down here on the, the lower stage. And I don't have time to address what's going up on the upper stage up there in heaven in this short message. But I will acknowledge that the action in heaven looks a bit strange to us. Now, a lot of people think that the key question of the book of Job is where is God in the midst of suffering? It's the same question that we tend to ask uh, in times of uncertainty. Where's God? But that's not the key question. The key question on the upper stage, and really the question of the whole book of Job, is in chapter 1, verse 9. Does Job fear God for nothing? For us today, I will ask it this way. Will we follow God? Will we trust God in the midst of uncertainty and difficulty? See, the idea proposed in this book is God, Job is devoted to you and worships you because it's in his best self-interest. Translation, does Job or do we follow God only when things are good? Is it just quid pro quo? That was the evil one's argument, that Job loves God because of what God does for him. And he says to God, if you turn off the faucet, of blessing, watch how fast Job will turn on you. He will no longer be devoted to you. See, this is the evil one's way, even today. Now, when Job gets hit with the second wave of suffering, his body is covered with painful sores from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. He sits on an ash heap and he scrapes the sores with pottery shards. Imagine it. And then he responds again, but this time there are some subtle differences in his response. He does not fall to the ground in worship. He does not say, the name of the Lord be praised. He actually goes to an ash heap. He's sitting on the town dump. Maybe that's an act of grieving. Or maybe he's quarantined like a leopard. And his wife comes to him and says, curse God and die. This probably didn't help. So let me say a word about Mrs. Job, because she gets criticized a lot. She too has lost all she had. She too has lost her children. She will now have to care for a horribly diseased husband until he dies. And then she will be left alone and destitute. She gives voice to the thoughts that surely have occurred to Job and that occur to us, to all of us when life gets difficult. Or uncertain. Now he doesn't do it. Job doesn't take her advice. But notice what he says to her in Job chapter 2 verse 10. He says, you're talking like a foolish woman. Should we accept good from God and not trouble? Now Job is struggling to understand God now. Is, is God the kind of God who sends trouble? Is God really good? 
And we're told at this point, you know, after the second wave of suffering, that Job did not sin in what he said. Now, remember, after the first wave in chapter 1, verse 22, the text simply says, in all this, Job did not sin. But now there's a little qualification. Job did not sin in what he said, which means in his heart, Job has begun to struggle. One more thing. Job's friends hear about all his troubles, and they go and find him because they want to comfort him. Here's what... We are told in the second chapter of Job, when they saw Job from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep out loud. They tore their robes and they sprinkled dust on their heads. They had heard that it was bad about Job, but nothing prepared them for this. Now, usually when you visit somebody in a bad condition, you try to cheer them up. You tell them, that's not so bad. You don't look so bad, but have you ever been sick and had somebody come to visit you, take one look at you and burst into tears and rip their clothes, their garments? And things are bad. And the Bible says that they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. And no one said a word because they saw how great his suffering was. This is maybe the greatest example of what God commands us to do in the book of Romans when he says, mourn with those who mourn. It's interesting to me that he doesn't say, fix people who mourn. He doesn't say, give advice to people who mourn. He doesn't say, tell people who mourn they shouldn't mourn and that everything's going to be okay. He doesn't say, tell them, ah, if you just had enough faith, if you pray hard enough, if you, if you believe hard enough, you know, the kind of dumb things that we sometimes say to other people. It just says, mourn with them. And that's what his friends do. It's interesting that after the seven days are done, they will speak a lot and they will get in trouble for it. Finally, after seven days, Job speaks. And if he can just repeat what he said in chapter one, you know, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. If he can just repeat that, the test will be over and Job would really be a short book, a short, happy book. But that's not what he says. Job chapter three, after this, Job opened his mouth and he cursed the day of his birth. And for the next 28 chapters, Job pours out a level of bitterness and confusion and sorrow and doubt and anger towards God that is staggering. Listen to what he says in chapter 6. The arrows of the Almighty are in me. My spirit drinks their poison. God, terrors are marshaled against me. Hey God, you're shooting at me. Or, God says in, uh, or Job says in chapter 19, God has wronged me and drawn his net around me. Uh, maybe this is how you feel during these uncertain times. God, why have you wronged me? It's so ironic to me that sometimes people will speak about the patience of Job. <laughs> Not in this book. Job's words, as you read through the book, are incredibly impatient. How long, Lord? Why me? Make it stop. Where are you? Can you identify? Now, sometimes in suffering, we're told, "Ah, just trust God. But not in this book. Job accuses God. Job blames God. Job challenges God. Job attacks God. He confronts God and he does this in such an honest and raw way that the three pious, God-believing friends that have come to comfort him can't stand it anymore. Job, what are you saying? And they argue with him, and they present an alternate view to what Job is saying. Now, their, their point of view is still with us today, but it comes from what's called Mesopotamian wisdom literature. And the core idea of this literature is that If you're suffering, you must have done something bad. So if you find yourself suffering, you need to identify what you're doing wrong and stop doing it. And then your life will be good. 
Now, if you've ever read the book of Job, you've noticed that in the middle 30 chapters of the book, uh, they get incredibly repetitive. And this is actually on purpose. See, the writer hits us over the head with this, the idea that, that, that we earn our blessing and our suffering is really not true. It's funny how often in suffering and uncertainty, we're told, just, just trust God. But Job doesn't do that. Instead, he challenges God. He wrestles with God. And now in chapter 38, Job gets his wish. It says, then the Lord spoke to Job out of a storm. Notice if you read through the book of Job, that when God does appear, he doesn't seem to get around to answering Job's question of why. And this is very important and very deliberate. God does not tell Job what the writer has told us about the upper stage and the scenes that occur in chapters one and two. He doesn't tell him about the conversation that he's had with Satan, the accuser. In fact, Job never finds out about the upper stage. Why? Because Job's story is our story. In this life, on this not so okay earth, where you live and I live down here on this lower stage, we don't get to know. We don't get to see. We don't get to hear. We don't get to understand. Instead, Job finds out about something actually way better. He finds out who God is. Irrationally loving, incredibly good, and that's enough. Now, the book of Job ends with a little epilogue that is very significant. God says to Job's comforters in chapter 42, verse 7, I'm angry with you, (laughs) with the comforters, the the righteous ones who, who came and argued with him because he says, you have spoken of me what you have not spoken of me what is right. Uh, as my servant Job has. Now remember, Job complains about God. He yells at God. He accuses God of shooting him with arrows. And, and his friends, well, they stick up for God and they defend God. So they think that they're right. But then God shows up and says, uh, nope, Job was right and you were wrong. In fact, what he says is, if Job will pray for you, I will forgive you. Uh, chapter 42, verse 10, and the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. A reminder that if we are faithful, one day all things will be set right. A reminder that faithfulness does not guarantee a pain-free life on this earth. It does not guarantee position or success or certainty or wealth or, or health. See, the central question of the book of Job Uh, And in the book of Job, and actually for us today, is could a human being hold on to God when it does not seem to pay off at all? One could, and one did. See, Job could not see the upper stage. Uh, Job did not know that his faithfulness had meaning beyond his wildest dreams. Uh, Job did not know that his faithfulness in suffering was being used by God to vindicate God's plan for this planet, for mankind. And Job's honesty and his perseverance have been used now for thousands of years to inspire billions of people who live in the land of us. Hang on. Keep going. Don't let go. Don't give up. See, you have no idea. God is so close. God is so good. The writer wants to say that, not just to Job, but he wants to say it to us. And he wants us to say it to each other. He wants us to hear it for ourselves. See, we live in the land of us. We live in the land of anxiety and fear and failure and divorce and relational breakdown and confusion and hurt. We all do. Why? I don't know. How long will it last? I don't know. But if you hang on, if you endure, if you remain faithful, you will experience the restoration God has in store for you. May it be so.
Hello, my name is Thor Thordarsson, and I am so excited to have this opportunity to lead the four Advent Health facilities in our communities. In many ways, it feels like I'm returning home to continue the legacy of more than 100 years of healing ministry in our communities. We've learned a lot during this partnership with Amita, but now we're able to focus on building a much stronger Adventist identity in our communities. One thing that you can be certain of, no matter what the change, and that is our commitment to fulfill the mission of extending the healing ministry of Jesus. As always, I am so appreciative of the partnership that we have with you, our constituent churches. And along with the rest of the leadership team and the talented healthcare professionals that make up Advent Health, I'm looking forward to working with you as we fulfill that mission and continue the legacy of healing ministry in our communities. So I'm kind of curious, uh, when was the last time that you had to navigate desert space in your life. And, and I know for some of you, it's, it's been a while. You have never seen better days than you're experiencing right now. But we know something, don't we? That in a broken and a fallen world, all of us will have to navigate the desert, uh, the land between, sooner or later at one time or another. And one of the characteristics of the desert is just shortage. I mean, a, a physical, literal desert. There's like a shortage of water, a shortage of food, a shortage of shade. And if you're traveling through desert space today, if you find yourself in the land between, I'm guessing that you're experiencing some kind of shortage. It might be a shortage of strength. You're just running low on strength. It might be a shortage of direction, a shortage of hope, perhaps a shortage of friendship. You just feel alone. And uh, near the beginning of our Bible, there's a desert story, a wilderness story that is marked by shortage. Uh, a group called the Israelites. They leave slavery in Egypt. They're heading toward the land of promise. And their leader, Moses, he is just run down, exhausted and tired. The people are not cooperating. And he just has this meltdown moment where he goes, this is too heavy. I can't carry this anymore. And the very next paragraph, it's like the Lord speaks into the situation it says, now Moses, uh, you gather some leaders and I will empower them to help you carry this load so you're not alone. So you don't have to carry it all by yourself. I love the words. They will share the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. You won't have to carry it all by yourself. You see, the land between is fertile ground for meltdown. It's also fertile ground for God's provision. So here's the question, what if God just didn't do that for Moses? What, what if he delights in providing for us in our weakest moments? Uh, part of the Lord's prayer, Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. It's a great prayer. Gracious God, please provide today the things I need today. Please provide today the patience I need today. Please provide today the friendship, the relationship, the connection that I need today. Please provide today the hope that I need today. Please provide today the things that I need today. Those of you that are navigating desert space, the land between right now, I ask that you would discover, experience God as someone who is gracious and kind. That you would come to know him as the God who provides. 
I ask that our Lord would provide exactly what you need today. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight 
and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and was sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. 
enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations.
The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid?
Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.